Uh, we have a special guest in Mission Control. We have uh, Camille Ayin from the International Space Station Program Science Office. Uh, welcome, Camille. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for having me. And you're here to talk about plant science today because yes. we also have a special guest on the telephone line that we'll talk to in just a minute uh, who is a principal investigator of one of the interesting experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, but tell us a little bit, first of all, about what we've been learning from plant biology on the International Space Station. Well, we've been doing plant research in space for about 25 years. And we've really advanced our fundamental knowledge in several areas. First, we've learned how plants respond to gravity, and the technical term is gravitropism. Tropism meaning the external or environmental stimuli that plants respond to in order to grow. And gravitropism means that they are responding to gravity in order, in order to grow. So in Plant Biology 101 or Botany 101, we've learned that stalks grow up towards the light, and that's called phototropism, and uh, roots grow down because of gravity, um, and that's called gravitropism. And I think Dr. Paul, in a few minutes, will um, talk to us about what we've learned recently, her findings in, in the, and the knowledge base in this area. We've also learned how to inform the design of advanced plant growth habitats or facilities. And these are facilities that have grown in complexity and uh, functionality and capability over time. We've achieved the complete life cycle of plants, meaning we've gone from seed to seed. So we've gone from seeds to plant growth, to full plants, mature plants, and that plant has been able to produce seeds that are viable. So we've learned that. And then we've uh, demonstrated the physiological processes that are necessary for biological life support, that those are sustainable. And those are critical if we want to further explore space over long durations. And so the research we've done over the last 25 years has really also identified some critical areas that we still need to research um, in areas such as the impact of gravity on the cellular and tissue levels of plants, the whole plant level and then communities of plants level. And there are a whole suite of these different experiments. They look at different kinds of plants. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've recently gotten some results from one particular experiment, one that we call TAGES. Mm -hmm. Let's bring in uh, Annalisa Paul from Florida. Uh, welcome. Thank you. And Annalisa, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you are, and what your line of research is? Sure. Um, my, I am a research associate professor at the University of Florida in the Department of Horticultural Sciences. Um, also, that's the program of plant molecular and cellular biology. I uh, am essentially a molecular biologist uh, by trade and interested in essentially how plants work at the gene level and what turns genes on, what turns them off, and how plants respond, especially to environmental stress and, in particular, novel environmental stresses like, say, spaceflight. I think we have some interesting video of uh, the TAGES experiment. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about TAGES, what it stands for, and what you're looking for there as we air this video. Sure. Um, TAGES stands for Transgenic Arabidopsis Gene Expression System, and it actually has some spaceflight heritage over the past 10 years in uh, a number of different types of experiments that we've conducted. We have engineered these plants to be reporters of their environment, so that they, um, that's what the transgenic part is, with a green fluorescent protein that can respond to environmental cues, uh, microgravity being one of them. That's actually not the major focus of this particular experiment that you're highlighting right now, but it uses the same hardware, and that is it takes video images of the plants as they grow. Because we can use this uh, very sophisticated imaging hardware developed by Kennedy Space Center to collect images of the plants every six hours, we can essentially get these movies of how the plants traverse across the surface of these nutrient plates in which we uh, place them. The uh, information that we can get from that not only is some of the gene expression data, which is the subject of, a, of another sub-study, but also how they grow and how they grow over time and how they navigate across that surface. And that's really the focus of this particular study that uh, gave us some very interesting results, unexpected ones, too. You know, we've been showing some pictures uh, of the experiment results that you've just published, and one of them was a view that shows a lot of blue and red markers. Could you explain that a little bit to us, why you uh, highlighted those? Yes. And so the blue and red is helps you track uh, over time. So each, each little segment alternating red and blue is six hours, or represents six hours on the, on the tape, I guess 
guess you could say. So the plant grows for six hours, it gets a little blue tag, another six hours it gets a red one. And so what that allowed us to do is to then mathematically map the progress of the roots across the plates, and that could be then graphed, and we could calculate and use statistical analyses to show that the divergence of the, the, the pattern of growth from what you would consider a straight vertical is, uh, is a statistically significant phenomenon that we see on, on orbit. And that's why we tag them that way, is just to help us cue into it and give it a, a, a number, essentially. Okay, and as I look at those pictures, they look remarkably similar, the ground version versus the one that was grown in space. Yes, and that's, that's the thing. And so what you can see is all those plants, well, there's two different cultivars of plants on those plates. Cultivars meaning different um, ecotypes. They're slightly different genetically, but, but very, very similar. Um, the ones that, that are, as you look at it, sort of on the right, those cultivars naturally on the ground will just go straight down the surface of a plate. The ones that are on the left will grow a little bit, a little bit of a jog to the, to, the, to the left as you look at them. But from the plant's point of view, they, they skew to the right, and that's how I'll, I'll talk about it. And so naturally on Earth, those particular types of Arabidopsis plants, and many plants, do this thing called skewing and also waving. And when you look at the comparisons between the ones on flight and the ones on the ground, they both look like they're growing straight down the plate and they're skewing to the left. Now, what is strange is when you think about it, if you ask a person on the street, well, how do you think plant roots would grow in microgravity? They say, well, you know, pretty much everybody knows that gravity pulls the... Uh, the gravitropism such that they grow down, and so you'd expect if there is no gravity that they'll get kind of a squirrely, random kind of look to the growth, but they don't. And when we first saw those pictures, when they first came, started coming down to us, we were surprised that not only did they grow very cleanly, you know, straight away from, from the, the top of the plate, if you will, but they also do this skewing behavior. And the reason why that is, is particularly interesting is because the, the dogma is in the literature and, and, and most of us have always thought is this skewing, this jog to the left phenomenon is, is thought to have been a combination of how the plant surfaces the, 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 or senses the surface of the environment that it's touching, like the, the soil or in this case the top of the auger, and the force of gravity then pulling down on those roots without... Um, Without gravity, people thought that, you know, you wouldn't have this kind of skewing phenomenon. But we see it, and we see it quite, quite strongly. And that is the surprising part, is that we see that pattern that looks very much like what we see on the ground controls. Well, and I know you're interested in plant growth at the genetic level. What is this telling you that, that might affect the way we grow plants here on Earth or the way we might grow them uh, on long-duration space flights uh, to distant destinations? Well, that's a, that's a complex question, and there's two, two good parts there. And so, so bring me back to what this tells us about long-term spaceflight growth. But let me ask you first about what does it tell us fundamentally? And that is, as I said, a number part, the other part of this particular experiment is looking at the gene expression patterns, and that's the subject of a different paper. But we know that looking at the patterns of how genes are turned on or turned off in the spaceflight environment actually recapitulates some of the things that we see morphologically. And so, um, a lot of the genes that we see that are that are expressed also are um, related to how cells, especially cell walls, are remodeled. And so, if you look at some of those genes, they're also ones that that dictate how plants um, do this kind of skewing phenomenon. And so, that gives us a very fundamental look into how plants turn their mechanisms on and off. By um, in a very fundamental kind of level, so that's that's one of the things that that is uh, also interesting to us. It also gives us a clue that the the ability for plants to have these kinds of behaviors, if you will, is inherent. It's something that is that is not requiring a gravitational um, response. And remember, these are growing in a novel environment, something that's absolutely outside their evolutionary experience. And so, what that tells us is that. Even though plants have never evolved with a gravity-free environment, there are these inherent mechanisms by which the seed will germinate and the roots will grow away from where the seed is planted in, the, in search of nutrients and water, etc. 
And we've known for a long time that, that of course, they can do this without gravity from a lot of the other previous um, experiments. But to see that they use the same inherent mechanisms, by, with, like with the skewing and these waving phenomena, that is a real fundamental uh, interesting phenomenon that we've seen. Now, does this make us better gardeners in space? Well, yes, it does. Because what that, what that shows us is it sort of takes some of the, um, the uh, um, concern about how, how well plants do, how well plants will be able to adapt to environments where the gravity is altered for long periods of time. As Camille said, that we have grown plants on orbit from seed to seed, so we know that they can do it. We also know, though, though they engage a lot of metabolic processes that, um, that they know they're in space. They know that they're in a place that's, that's not exactly ideal, but nonetheless that they can manage it. The more information we get on the, the how and the why of, of how they mount these responses, that allows us to be better and better gardeners in designing our habitats and designing the hardware that supports these plants. And that's what will help us in the long term because, you know, when we leave Earth's orbit, no matter where we leave, we'll be taking plants with us, just like the guys who were going out to the Oregon Trail took their plants with us. And we have to adjust to the new environments and the new situations that we'll have to put them in. And all these kind of data informs that. And so I guess what you're getting at there is that uh, what you're learning now not only would help us grow plants that would help support people on long journeys uh, to other worlds, but also it might help us be able to cultivate them on those other worlds, even though, say, in Mars, you've got one-third of the gravity you have on Earth. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, uh, it, uh, it gives us an insight as to um, what, uh, what mechanisms plants use to adjust to those kinds of uh, new and novel situations. Well, Dr. Paul, I want to thank you very much for joining us here today, and, and we're going to go back to Camille here for some, some wrapping up questions here about uh, the International Space Station research and other plant. But I did want to ask you one more thing. You've got another experiment called BRIC-17. Could you tell us a little bit about that one? Ah, sure. Um, BRIC-17 is, instead of using seedlings for, you know, Arabidopsis-type seedlings or, or small plants, it uses undifferentiated cells. <laughs> and that, in a nutshell, is... Um, the, the, they're still Arabidopsis cells, but instead of being looking like seedlings, they look a little bit, well, like couscous on the surface of a plate. They are, all the cells are essentially the same, and they don't have the same kind of um, roots and shoots and, and um, um, sensing organs, that, that, if you like. The, our initial BRIC experiment, BRIC-16, we did run these undifferentiated cells plus the um, um, regular seedlings, and we found that the undifferentiated cells respond in a dramatically, profoundly different way. And so our follow-on experiment is to explore um, the mechanisms by which they, they engage these gene expression patterns that are so extraordinary, mostly heat shock genes that there should be no reason for them to be induced. And so we designed this follow-on experiment with different types of mutants and different types of gene pathways that will allow us to test some of the hypotheses that we developed from our first brick experiment, which uh, flew last year. Well, thanks again for being with us today, and maybe we can bring you back when you've got some results from uh, the brick experiments that you can talk about. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, thanks for being with us again. And, and Camille, any last thoughts about plant research on the space station and, and how it may apply to making benefits for people here on Earth in the long run? Mm -hmm. When we talk about the benefits of ISS research or any type of research we're doing on the International Space Station, we categorize that in three ways. We talk about discovery, that's the fundamental knowledge we gain. We talk about space benefits, which is what Dr. Paul talked about with her plants, the fact that plants are a great food source for long duration space flight. But then we also talk about Earth benefits, and that's the benefits that have an impact on our lives and improve the quality of our lives. So there are a couple investigations. Dr. Paul talked about BRIC-17-1. There's a BRIC-17-2 um, that's looking at the anoxic response, anoxic meaning a low oxygen environment or low oxygen conditions, and how these plants respond in, in the space flight environment under these conditions. Um, so researchers are hoping that the results from that would help them develop genetic engineering countermeasures for terrestrial plants who suffer the same stressful environment. 
there's also another investigation that was done a couple years ago called National Lab Pathfinder Cells, and that was looking at the effect of microgravity on biofuel plants. And we know biofuel plants have a high... Uh, content of oil that could be extracted and used as fuel or renewable energy. And so they're hoping that the results from those can contribute to alternative energy crop production that can be accessible to U.S. farmers. So those are a couple of the earth benefits um, that we are look for, looking forward to from some of the plant research we're doing on the ISS. All right. Well, uh, Camille Ayin uh, from the International Program Science Office, thank you much for joining us today. And, thank you, Kelly. And, and, and Annalisa Paul from uh, the Florida University, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I think that very interesting work going on on the space station with this plant research, just one of the many types of research we're doing on the space station. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.